The 1991 Soviet coup d'état attempt, also known as the August coup, Russian Avgustovsky Putsch (TR Avgustovsky Putsch, August Putsch) was an attempt made by members of the government of the USSR to take control of the country from Soviet President and General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev. The coup leaders were hard-line members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union CPSU, who were opposed to Gorbachev's reform program and the new union treaty that he had negotiated which decentralized much of the central government's power to the republics. They were opposed, mainly in Moscow, by a short but effective campaign of civil resistance led by Russian President Boris Yeltsin, who had been both an ally and critic of Gorbachev. Although the coup collapsed in only two days and Gorbachev returned to power, the event destabilized the USSR and is widely considered to have contributed to both the demise of the CPSU and the dissolution of the USSR. After the capitulation of the State Committee on the State of Emergency GKCHP, popularly referred to as the Gang of Eight, both the Supreme Court of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic RSFSR and Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev described their actions as a coup attempt. <laughs> Topic. Background Since assuming power as General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1985, Gorbachev had embarked on an ambitious program of reform, embodied in the twin concepts of perestroika and glasnost, meaning economic, political restructuring and openness, respectively. These moves prompted resistance and suspicion on the part of hardline members of the nomenclatura. The reforms also unleashed some forces and movements that Gorbachev did not expect. Specifically, nationalist agitation on the part of the Soviet Union's non-Russian minorities grew, and there were fears that some or all of the Union republics might secede. In 1991, the Soviet Union was in a severe economic and political crisis. Scarcity of food, medicine, and other consumables was widespread, people had to stand in long lines to buy even essential goods, fuel stocks were up to 50% less than the estimated need for the approaching winter, and inflation was over 300% per year, with factories lacking in cash needed to pay salaries. In 1990, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Armenia and Georgia had already declared the restoration of their independence from the Soviet Union. In January 1991, there was an attempt to return Lithuania to the Soviet Union by force. About a week later, there was a similar attempt by local pro-Soviet forces to overthrow the Latvian authorities. There were continuing armed ethnic conflicts in Nagorno-Karabakh and South Ossetia. Russia declared its sovereignty on the 12th of June 1990 and thereafter limited the application of Soviet laws, in particular the laws concerning finance and the economy on Russian territory. The Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR adopted laws which contradicted Soviet laws, the so-called War of Laws. In the Union-wide referendum on the 17th of March 1991, boycotted by the Baltic states, Armenia, Georgia, and Moldova, the majority of the residents of the rest of the republics expressed the desire to retain the renewed Soviet Union. Following negotiations, 8 of the 9 republics except Ukraine approved the new Union Treaty with some conditions. The treaty would make the Soviet Union a federation of independent republics with a common president, foreign policy, and military. Russia, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan were to sign the treaty in Moscow on 20 August 1991. <laughs> Preparation On the 11th of December 1990, KGB Chairman Vladimir Kryuchkov made a call for order over central television in Moscow. That day, he asked two KGB officers to prepare a plan of measures that could be taken in case a state of emergency was declared in the USSR. Later, Kryuchkov brought Soviet Defense Minister Dmitry Yazov, Internal Affairs Minister Boris Pugo, Premier Valentin Pavlov, Vice President Gennady Yanayev, Soviet Defense Council Deputy Chief Oleg Baklanov, Gorbachev Secretariat Head Valery Bolden, and CPSU Central Committee Secretary Oleg Shenin into the conspiracy. The members of the GKCHP hoped that Gorbachev could be persuaded to declare the state of emergency and to restore order. 
On 23 July 1991, a number of party functionaries and literati published in the hardline newspaper Sovetskia Rossiya a piece entitled A Word to the People which called for decisive action to prevent disastrous calamity. Six days later, Gorbachev, Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Kazakh President Nursultan Nazarbayev discussed the possibility of replacing such hardliners as Pavlov, Yazov, Kriuchkov and Pugo with more liberal figures. Kriuchkov, who had placed Gorbachev under close surveillance as Subject 110 several months earlier, eventually got wind of the conversation. On 4 August, Gorbachev went on holiday to his dacha in Forest, Crimea. He planned to return to Moscow in time for the new Union Treaty signing on 20 August. On 17 August, the members of the GKCHP met at a KGB guesthouse in Moscow and studied the treaty document. They believed the pact would pave the way to the Soviet Union's breakup, and decided that it was time to act. The next day, Baklanov, Bolden, Shenan, and USSR Deputy Defense Minister General Valentin Varenikov flew to Crimea for a meeting with Gorbachev. They demanded that Gorbachev either declare a state of emergency or resign and name Yaniyev as acting president to allow the members of the GKCHP to restore order. In the country, Gorbachev has always claimed that he refused point blank to accept the ultimatum. Varenikov has insisted that Gorbachev said, Damn you! Do what you want! But report my opinion! However, those present at the dacha at the time testified that Baklanov, Bolden, Shenan, and Varenikov had been clearly disappointed and nervous after the meeting with Gorbachev. With Gorbachev's refusal, the conspirators ordered that he remain confined to the forest dacha. At the same time, the dacha's communication lines, which were controlled by the KGB, were shut down. Additional KGB security guards were placed at the dacha gates with orders to stop anybody from leaving. The members of the GKCHP ordered 250,000 pairs of handcuffs from a factory in PSKOV to be sent to Moscow and 300,000 arrest forms. Kriuchkov doubled the pay of all KGB personnel, called them back from holiday, and placed them on alert. The Lefortovo prison was emptied to receive prisoners. Topic: The coup chronology. The members of the GKCHP met in the Kremlin after Baklanov, Bolden, Shenan, and Varenikov returned from Crimea. Yaniyev, Pavlov and Baklanov signed the so-called Declaration of the Soviet Leadership, in which they declared the state of emergency in all of the USSR and announced that the State Committee on the State of Emergency, Gosudarsneni Komitet po Krivikinomu Polozhenyu GKCP or Gosudarsneni Komitet po Krezichenomu Polozhenyu, GKCHP, had been created to manage the country and to effectively maintain the regime of the state of emergency. The GKCHP included the following members Gennady Yaniyev, Vice President Valentin Pavlov, Prime Minister Vladimir Kriuchkov, Head of the KGB Dmitry Yazov, Minister of Defense Boris Pugo, Minister of Interior Oleg Baklanov, Member of the CPSU Central Committee Vasily Starodutsev, Chairman of the Peasant Union Alexander Tizyakov, President of the Association of the State Enterprises and Objects of Industry, Transport, and Communication Shanayev signed the decree naming himself as acting USSR President on the pretext of Gorbachev's inability to perform presidential duties due to illness. These eight collectively became known as the Gang of Eight. The GKCHP banned all newspapers in Moscow, except for nine party-controlled newspapers. The GKCHP also issued a populist declaration which stated that the honor and dignity of the Soviet man must be restored. Topic: The 19th of August. All of the State Committee on the State of Emergency (GKCHP) documents were broadcast over the state radio and television starting from 7 a.m. The Russian SFSR controlled Radio Rossiya and Televideni Rossiya, plus Echo Moskvi, the only independent political radio station, were cut off the air. Armor units of the Tamanskaya Division and the Kantamirovskaya Tank Division rolled into Moscow along with paratroops. Four Russian SFSR People's Deputies, who were considered the most 
dangerous, were detained by the KGB at an army base near Moscow. The conspirators considered detaining Russian SFSR President Boris Yeltsin upon his arrival from a visit to Kazakhstan on 17 August, or after that when he was at his dacha near Moscow, but for an undisclosed reason did not do so. The failure to arrest Yeltsin proved fatal to their plans. Yeltsin arrived at the White House, Russia's parliament building, at 9 a.m. on Monday 19 August. Together with Russian SFSR Prime Minister Ivan Silayev and Supreme Soviet Chairman Ruslan Kaspolitov, Yeltsin issued a declaration that condemned the GKCHEP's actions as a reactionary anti-constitutional coup. The military was urged not to take part in the coup. The declaration called for a general strike with the demand to let Gorbachev address the people. This declaration was distributed around Moscow in the form of flyers. In the afternoon, the citizens of Moscow began to gather around the White House and to erect barricades around it. In response, Gennady Yanayev declared the state of emergency in Moscow at 1600. Yanayev declared at the press conference at 1700 that Gorbachev was resting. He said, over these years he has got very tired and needs some time to get his health back. Meanwhile, Major Evdokimov, chief of staff of a tank battalion of the Tamanskaya Division guarding the White House, declared his loyalty to the leadership of the Russian SFSR. Yeltsin climbed one of the tanks and addressed the crowd. Unexpectedly, this episode was included in the state media's evening news. Topic: The 20th of August. At noon, Moscow Military District Commander General Kalinin, whom Yanayev appointed as military commandant of Moscow, declared a curfew in Moscow from 2300 to 5 o'clock, effective from 20 August. This was understood as the sign that the attack on the White House was imminent. The defenders of the White House prepared themselves, most of them being unarmed. Evdokimov's tanks were moved from the White House in the evening. The makeshift White House Defense Headquarters was headed by General Konstantin Kobitz, a Russian SFSR People's Deputy. In the afternoon, Kryuchkov, Yaziv and Pugo finally decided to attack the White House. This decision was supported by other GKCHP members. Kryuchkov and Yaziv's deputies, KGB General Agayev and Army General Vladislav Akilov, respectively, planned the assault, codenamed Operation Grom. Thunder, which would gather elements of the Alpha and Vimpel elite special force units, with the support of the paratroopers, Moscow OMON, the internal troops of the Dzezhinsky division, three tank companies and a helicopter squadron. Alpha Group Commander General Viktor Karpukhin and other senior officers of the unit together with Airborne Troops Deputy Commander General Alexander Lebed mingled with the crowds near the White House and assessed the possibility of such an operation. After that, Karpukin and Vimpel commander Colonel Beskov tried to convince Agayev that the operation would result in bloodshed and should be cancelled. Lebed, with the consent of his immediate superior, Pavel Grashev, returned to the White House and secretly informed the defense headquarters that the attack would begin at 2 o'clock. While the events were unfolding in the capital, Estonia's Supreme Council declared at 23.03 the full reinstatement of the independent status of the Republic of Estonia after 41 years. Topic: The 21st of August. At about one o'clock, not far from the White House, trolleybuses and street cleaning machines barricaded a tunnel against oncoming Taman Guards infantry fighting vehicles (IFVs). Three men were killed in the incident: Dmitry Komar, Vladimir Usov, and Ilya Krishevsky, while several others were wounded. Komar, a 22-year-old veteran from the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, was shot and crushed trying to cover a moving IFV's observation slit. USOV, a 37-year-old economist, was killed by a stray bullet whilst coming to Komar's aid. The crowd set fire to an IFV and Krishevsky, a 28-year-old architect, was shot dead as the troops escaped. According to Sergei Parkhomenko, a journalist and democracy campaigner who was in the crowd defending the White House, those deaths played a crucial role. Both sides were so horrified that it brought a halt to everything. Alpha Group and Vimpel did not move to the White House as had been planned and Yaziv ordered the troops to pull out from Moscow. The troops began to move from Moscow at 8 o'clock. 
The GKCHP members met in the Defense Ministry and, not knowing what to do, decided to send Kriuchkov, Yazov, Baklanov, Tizyakov, Anatoly Lukyanov, and Deputy CPSU General Secretary Vladimir Ivashko to Crimea to meet Gorbachev, who refused to meet them when they arrived. With the Dacha's communications to Moscow restored, Gorbachev declared all the GKCHP's decisions void and dismissed its members from the state offices. The USSR General Prosecutor's Office started the investigation of the coup. During that period, the Supreme Council of the Republic of Latvia declared its sovereignty officially completed with a law passed by its deputies, confirming the Independence Restoration Act of 4 May as an official act. In Tallinn, just a day after the restitution of independence, the Tallinn TV tower was taken over by the airborne troops. While the television broadcast was cut off for a while, the radio signal was strong as a handful of Estonian Defence League, the Unified Paramilitary Armed Forces of Estonia, members barricaded the entry into signal rooms. In the evening, as news of the failure of the coup reached the Republic, the paratroopers departed from the tower and left the capital. Topic: The 22nd of August. Gorbachev and the GKCHP delegation flew to Moscow, where Kriuchkov, Yazov, and Tizyakov were arrested upon arrival in the early hours. Pugo committed suicide along with his wife the next day. Pavlov, Vasily Starodutsev, Baklanov, Bolden, and Shenan would be in custody within the next 48 hours. Topic. Aftermath Since several heads of the regional executive committees supported the GKCHP, on 21 August the Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR adopted Decision No. 1626-1, which authorized Russian President Boris Yeltsin to appoint heads of regional administrations, although the Russian constitution did not empower the president with such authority. It passed another decision the next day which declared the old imperial colors as Russia's national flag. It eventually replaced the Russian SFSR flag two months later. On the night of 24 August, the Felix Dzerzhinsky statue in front of the KGB building at Dzerzhinsky Square Lubyanka, was dismantled, while thousands of Moscow citizens took part in the funeral of Dmitry Komar, Vladimir Usov and Ilya Krushevsky, the three citizens who died in the tunnel incident. Gorbachev posthumously awarded them with the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Yeltsin asked their relatives to forgive him for not being able to prevent their deaths. <laughs> End of the CPSU Gorbachev resigned as CPSU General Secretary on 24 August. Vladimir Ivashko replaced him as acting general secretary but resigned on 29 August when the Supreme Soviet terminated all party activities in Soviet territory. Around the same time, Yeltsin decreed the transfer of the CPSU archives to the state archive authorities, as well as nationalizing all CPSU assets in the Russian SFSR, which included not only the headquarters of party committees but also educational institutions, hotels, etc. Yeltsin decreed the termination and banning of all party activities on Russian soil as well as the closure of the Central Committee building in Staria Square. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Dissolution of the Soviet Union. On the 24th of August, Mikhail Gorbachev created the so-called Committee for the Operational Management of the Soviet Economy. Komitet po operativnomu upravlenu narodnim hozishtvam sa to replace the USSR cabinet of ministers headed by Valentin Pavlov, a GKCHP member. Russian Prime Minister Ivan Silayev headed this committee. On the same day the Vakovna Rada adopted the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine and called for a referendum on support of the Declaration of Independence. The Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, the third most powerful republic in the Union, also declared its independence the next day on the 25th of August, which then established the Republic of Belarus. On the 5th of September, the Congress of People's Deputies of the Soviet Union adopted Soviet Law Number no. 2392-1 on the authorities of the Soviet Union in the transitional period under which the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union had replaced Congress of People's Deputies and was reformed. 
Two new legislative chambers the Soviet of the Union Soviet Sousa and the Soviet of Republics Soviet Respublic replaced the Soviet of the Union and the Soviet of Nationalities both elected by the USSR Congress of People's Deputies. The Soviet of the Union was to be formed by the popularly elected USSR People's Deputies. The Soviet of Republics was to include 20 deputies from each Union Republic plus one deputy to represent each autonomous region of each Union Republic both USSR People's Deputies and Republican People's Deputies delegated by the legislatures of the Union Republic. Russia was an exception with 52 deputies. However, the delegation of each Union Republic was to have only one vote in the Soviet of Republics. The laws were to be first adopted by the Soviet of the Union and then by the Soviet of Republics. Also created was the Soviet State Council, Gosudarsneni Soviet Tsar which included the Soviet President and the Presidents of Union Republics. The Committee for the Operational Management of the Soviet Economy was replaced by the USSR Inter-Republican Economic Committee, Mezrespublikanske Ekonomiske Komitet Tsar also headed by Ivan Silayev. On 27 August, the first state became independent, when the Supreme Soviet of Moldova declared the independence of Moldova from the Soviet Union. The Supreme Soviets of Azerbaijan and Kyrgyzstan did the same on 30 and 31 August respectively. Afterwards, on 6 September the newly created Soviet State Council recognized the independence of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Estonia had declared re-independence on 20 August, Latvia on the following day, while Lithuania had done so already on of March 1990. Three days later, on 9 September the Supreme Soviet of Tajikistan declared the independence of Tajikistan from the Soviet Union. Furthermore, in September over 99% of voters in Armenia voted for a referendum approving the Republic's commitment to independence. The immediate aftermath of that vote was the Armenian Supreme Soviet's Declaration of Independence, issued on 21 September. By 27 October the Supreme Soviet of Turkmenistan declared the independence of Turkmenistan from the Soviet Union. On 1 December Ukraine held a referendum, in which more than 90% of residents supported the act of independence of Ukraine. By November, the only Soviet republics that had not declared independence were Russia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. That same month, seven republics Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan agreed to a new union treaty that would form a confederation called the Union of Sovereign States. However, this confederation never materialized. On 8 December Boris Yeltsin, Leonid Kravchuk and Stanislav Shushkovich, respectively leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus which adopted that name in August 1991, as well as the prime ministers of the republics met in Minsk, the capital of Belarus, where they signed the Belaveza Accords. This document declared that the Soviet Union had ceased to exist as a subject of international law and geopolitical reality. It repudiated the 1922 Union Treaty that established the Soviet Union, and established the Commonwealth of Independent States in the Union's place. On 12 December, the Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR ratified the accords and recalled the Russian deputies from the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. Although this has been interpreted as the moment that Russia seceded from the Union, in fact Russia took the line that it was not possible to secede from a state that no longer existed. The lower chamber of the Supreme Soviet, the Council of the Union, was forced to halt its operations, as the departure of the Russian deputies left it without a quorum. Doubts remained about the legitimacy of the signing that took place on 8 December, since only three republics took part. Thus, on 21 December in Alma-Ata on 21 December, the Alma-Ata Protocol expanded the CIS to include Armenia, Azerbaijan and the five republics of Central Asia. They also preemptively accepted Gorbachev's resignation. With 11 of the 12 remaining republics all except Georgia having agreed that the Union no longer existed, Gorbachev bowed to the inevitable and said he would resign as soon as the CIS became a reality. Georgia joined the CIS in 1993, only to withdraw in 2008 after conflict between Georgia and Russia. The three Baltic states never joined instead going on to join the European Union and NATO in 2004. On 24 December 1991, the Russian SFSR, now renamed the Russian Federation, 
with the concurrence of the other republics of the Commonwealth of Independent States, informed the United Nations that it would inherit the Soviet Union's membership in the UN, including the Soviet Union's permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. No member state of the UN formally objected to this step. The legitimacy of this act has been questioned by some legal scholars as the Soviet Union itself was not constitutionally succeeded by the Russian Federation, but merely dissolved. Others argued that the international community had already established the precedent of recognizing the Soviet Union as the legal successor of the Russian Empire, and so recognizing the Russian Federation as the Soviet Union's successor state was valid. On 25 December 1991, Gorbachev announced his resignation as Soviet president. The red hammer and sickle flag of the Soviet Union was lowered from the Senate building in the Kremlin and replaced with the tricolor flag of Russia. The next day, 26 December 1991, the Council of Republics, the upper chamber of the Supreme Soviet, formally voted the Soviet Union out of existence. The lower chamber, the Council of the Union, had been left without a quorum after the Russian deputies withdrew, thus ending the life of the world's first and oldest socialist state. All former Soviet embassies became Russian embassies while Russia received the nuclear weapons from the other former republics by 1996. A constitutional crisis occurred in 1993 had been escalated into violence and the new constitution adopted officially abolished the entire Soviet government. Topic. Beginning of radical economic reforms in Russia On 1 November 1991, the RSFSR Congress of People's Deputies issued Decision No. 1831-1 on the legal support of the economic reform whereby the Russian president Boris Yeltsin was granted the right to issue decrees required for the economic reform even if they contravened the laws. Such decrees entered into force if they were not repealed within seven days by the Supreme Soviet of the Russian SFSR or its presidium. Five days later, Boris Yeltsin, in addition to the duties of the president, assumed the duties of the prime minister. Yegor Gaidar became deputy prime minister and simultaneously economic and finance minister. On 15 November 1991 Boris Yeltsin issued Decree No. 213 on the liberalization of foreign economic activity on the territory of the RSFSR whereby all Russian companies were allowed to import and to export goods and to acquire foreign currency. Previously all foreign trade had been tightly controlled by the state. Following the issuing of Decree No. 213, on 3 December 1991 Boris Yeltsin issued Decree No. 297 on the measures to liberalize prices whereby from 2 January 1992 most previously existing price controls were abolished. <laughs> Topic. Trial of the members of the GKCHP The GKCHP members and their accomplices were charged with treason in the form of a conspiracy aimed at capturing power. However, by the end of 1992 they were all released from custody pending trial. The trial in the military chamber of the Russian Supreme Court began on 14 April 1993. On 23 February 1994 the State Duma declared amnesty for all GKCHP members and their accomplices, along with the participants of the October 1993 crisis. They all accepted the amnesty, except for General Varenikov, who demanded the continuation of the trial and was finally acquitted on of August 1994. <laughs> Topic. Commemoration of the civilians killed Thousands of people attended the funeral of Dmitry Komar, Ilya Krishevsky and Vladimir Usov on 24 August 1991. Gorbachev made the three men posthumous heroes of the Soviet Union, for their bravery, blocking the way to those who wanted to strangle democracy. <laughs> Parliamentary Commission In 1991 the Parliamentary Commission for Investigating Causes and Reasons of the Coup Attempt was established under Lev Ponomaryov, but in 1992 it was dissolved at Ruslan Kasbalatov's insistence. <laughs> <laughs> International reactions
Topic: United States. During his vacation in Kennebunkport, Maine, the President of the United States, George H. W. Bush made a blunt demand for Gorbachev's restoration to power and said the United States did not accept the legitimacy of the self-proclaimed new Soviet government. He returned to the White House after rushing from his vacation home. Bush then issued a strongly worded statement that followed a day of consultations with other leaders of the Western Alliance and a concerted effort to squeeze the new Soviet leadership by freezing economic aid programs. He decried the coup as a misguided and illegitimate effort that bypasses both Soviet law and the will of the Soviet peoples. President Bush called the overthrow very disturbing. And he put a hold on U.S. aid to the Soviet Union until the coup was ended. The Bush statement, drafted after a series of meetings with top aides at the White House, was much more forceful than the president's initial reaction that morning in Maine. It was in keeping with a unified Western effort to apply both diplomatic and economic pressure to the group of Soviet officials seeking to gain control of the country. Former President Ronald Reagan had said, I can't believe that the Soviet people will allow a reversal in the progress that they have recently made toward economic and political freedom. Based on my extensive meetings and conversations with him, I am convinced that President Gorbachev had the best interest of the Soviet people in mind. I have always felt that his opposition came from the communist bureaucracy, and I can only hope that enough progress was made that a movement toward democracy will be unstoppable. On September 2, 1991, the United States re-recognized the independence of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania when Bush delivered the press conference in Kennebunkport. <laughs> <laughs> United Kingdom The British Prime Minister John Major had expressed feelings in a 1991 interview on behalf of the UK about the coup and said, I think there are many reasons why it failed and a great deal of time and trouble will be spent on analyzing that later. There were, I think, a number of things that were significant. I don't think it was terribly well handled from the point of view of those organizing the coup. I think the enormous and unanimous condemnation of the rest of the world publicly of the coup was of immense encouragement to the people resisting it. That is not just my view, that is the view that has been expressed to me by Mr. Shevardnadze, Mr. Yakovlev, President Yeltsin and many others as well to whom I have spoken to the last 48 hours. The moral pressure from the West and the fact that we were prepared to state unequivocally that the coup was illegal and that we wanted the legal government restored, was of immense help in the Soviet Union. I think that did play a part. Major met with his cabinet that same day on 19 August to deal with the crisis. He added, There seems little doubt that President Gorbachev has been removed from power by an unconstitutional seizure of power. There are constitutional ways of removing the President of the Soviet Union, they have not been used. I believe that the whole world has a very serious stake in the events currently taking place in the Soviet Union. The reform process there is of vital importance to the world and of most vital importance of course to the Soviet people themselves and I hope that is fully clear. There is a great deal of information we don't yet have, but I would like to make clear above all that we would expect the Soviet Union to respect and honor all the commitments that President Gorbachev has made on its behalf, he said, echoing sentiments from a litany of other Western leaders. However, the British government had frozen $80 million in economic aid to Moscow, and the European Community scheduled an emergency meeting in which it was expected to suspend a $1.5 billion aid program. Other sovereign states Australia, Prime Minister Bob Hawke said, The developments in the Soviet Union, raised the question as to whether the purpose is to reverse the political and economic reforms which have been taking place. Australia does not want to see repression, persecution or vindictive actions against Gorbachev or those associated with him. Bulgaria, President Zelu Zelif has stated, 
Such anti-democratic methods can never lead to anything good neither for the Soviet Union, nor for Eastern Europe, nor for the democratic developments in the world." Canada. Several reactions to coup quickly happened such as the Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney had huddled with his top advisers discussed the toppling of Mikhail Gorbachev, but his officials said the Prime Minister will likely react cautiously to the stunning development. Mulroney condemned the coup and suspended food aid and other assurances with the Soviet Union. External Affairs Minister Barbara McDougall suggested on August 20, 1991 that Canada could work with any Soviet junta that promises to carry on Gorbachev's legacy. Lloyd Axworthy and Liberal leader Jean Chrétien said Canada must join with other Western governments to back Russian President Boris Yeltsin, former Soviet Foreign Minister and Georgian President Eduard Shevardnadze, and others fighting for Soviet democracy. McDougall met with the charge d'affaires of the Soviet embassy, Vasily Sredin. China, the Chinese government appeared tacitly to support the coup when it issued a statement saying the move was an internal affair of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of China released no immediate comment. Confidential Chinese documents have indicated that China's hardline leaders strongly disapprove of Gorbachev's program of political liberalization, blaming him for the loss of Eastern Europe to capitalism. Several Chinese people said that a key difference between the Soviet coup leaders' failed attempts to use tanks to crush dissent in Moscow and the hardline Chinese leaders' successful use of tank-led forces to smash the 1989 protest movement was that the Soviet people had a powerful leader like Russian President Boris Yeltsin to rally around, whereas the Chinese protesters did not. The Soviet coup collapsed in three days without any major violence by the Soviet army against civilians. In June 1989, the People's Liberation Army killed hundreds of people to crush the democracy movement. People all over Beijing are celebrating the failure of the coup tonight, said a young intellectual reached in Beijing today after word of the coup's collapse spread through the Chinese capital, mostly by way of foreign radio broadcasts. I personally know of some Communist Party members who are also celebrating. Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, the Czechoslovak president, warned his nation could face a possible wave of refugees crossing its border with the Ukrainian SSR. However, Havel said, it is not possible to reverse the changes that have already happened in the Soviet Union. We believe democracy will eventually prevail in the Soviet Union. Interior Ministry spokesman Martin Fendrich said an unspecified number of additional troops had been moved to reinforce the Czechoslovak border with the Soviet Union. Denmark, Foreign Minister Uff Ellemann Jensen said the process of change in the Soviet Union could not be reversed. In a statement he said, so much has happened and so many people have been involved in the changes in Soviet Union that I cannot see a total reversal. France, President François Mitterrand called on the new rulers of the Soviet Union to guarantee the life and liberty of Gorbachev and Russian President Boris Yeltsin, who was Gorbachev's rival in the changing Soviet Union. Mitterrand added, France attaches a high price to the life and liberty of Messrs. Gorbachev and Yeltsin being guaranteed by the new Moscow leaders. These will be judged by their acts, especially on the fashion in which the two high personalities in question will be treated. Germany, Chancellor Helmut Kohl cut his vacation short in Austria and returned to Bonn for an emergency meeting. Kohl had said he was sure Moscow would withdraw its remaining 272,000 troops from the former East Germany on schedule. Bjorn Engham, leader of Germany's opposition Social Democratic Party, urged member states of the European Community to speak with one voice on the situation and said, The West should not exclude the possibility of imposing economic and political sanctions on the Soviet Union to avoid a jolt to the right. In Moscow, Greece, Greece described the situation in the Soviet Union as alarming. The communist-led alliance of the left and former socialist Prime Minister Andreas Papandreou both issued statements condemning the coup. Hungary, Deputy Speaker of Parliament Morjas Suros said the coup increased the risk of a civil war in the Soviet Union. Undoubtedly, the Soviet economy has collapsed but this has not been the result of Gorbachev's policy but of the paralyzing influence of conservatives. Suros said. Suddenly, the likelihood of a civil war in the Soviet Union has increased. 
Iraq, Saddam Hussein's Iraq was a close ally of the Soviet Union until it condemned Baghdad during the Gulf War. One Iraqi spokesman quoted by the official Iraqi news agency, It is natural that we welcome such change like the states and people who were affected by the policies of the former regime. Israel, Israeli officials said they hoped Gorbachev's attempted removal had not derailed the conference held in Madrid or a slower Soviet Jewish immigration. The quasi-governmental Jewish agency, which has coordinated the massive flow of Jews arriving from the Soviet Union, called an emergency meeting to assess how the coup would affect Jewish immigration. We are closely following what is happening in the Soviet Union with concern. Foreign Minister David Levy said. One might say that this is an internal issue of the Soviet Union, but in the Soviet Union, everything internal has an influence for the entire world. Italy, Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti released a statement and said, I'm surprised, embittered and worried. We all know the difficulties that Gorbachev encountered. But I don't know how a new president, who, at least for now, doesn't have Gorbachev's prestige and international connections, can overcome the obstacles. Achille Aketo, the head of the Democratic Party of the Left, direct heir of the Italian Communist Party, called the ouster of Gorbachev, a most dramatic event of world proportions, which will have immense repercussions on international life. I am personally and strongly struck, not only for the incalculable burden of this event, but also for the fate of comrade Gorbachev. Japan, Prime Minister Toshiki Kaifu ordered the foreign ministry to analyze the developments. I strongly hope that the leadership change will not influence the positive policies of perestroika and new thinking diplomacy, said Chief Cabinet Secretary Misoji Sakamoto. In addition, Soviet aid and technical loans from Japan was frozen. South Korea, President Roh Tae-woo welcomed the coup's collapse as a symbolic victory for the Soviet people. He quoted, It was a triumph of the courage and resolve of the Soviet citizens towards freedom and democracy. Philippines, Philippine President Corazon Aquino expressed, Grave concern, and said, We hope that the progress toward world peace, achieved under the leadership of President Gorbachev will continue to be preserved and enhanced further. Poland, in a statement released by the President Lech Wałęsa, whose Solidarity Union helped prompt the collapse of communist regimes in Eastern Europe, appealed for calm. May unity and responsibility for our state gain the upper hand, Wałęsa said in a statement read on Polish radio by spokesman Andrzej Drymski. The situation in the USSR is significant for our country, it can affect our bilateral relations. We want them to be friendly. But he emphasized Poland kept its hard-won sovereignty while it pursued its economic and political reforms. South Africa, Foreign Minister Pick Bota said, I very much hope that developments in the Soviet Union will neither give rise to large-scale turbulence within the Soviet Union itself or more widely in Europe, nor jeopardize the era of hard-won international cooperation upon which the world has embarked. Yugoslavia, the country, consumed by its own internal dissent, followed the coup closely. I am afraid that conservatives in Yugoslavia may now try to grab power in our country, when they see how conservatives removed Gorbachev." A 51-year-old schoolteacher said, "...Gorbachev has done the most to bring a sort of democracy to both Eastern European countries and to the Soviet Union." Dragan Radic, 57, an economist, had said, Gorbachev has done a lot for world peace and helped replace hardline communist regimes in the past few years. Yet, the West failed to support Gorbachev financially and economically and he was forced to step down because he could not feed the Soviet people. <laughs> <laughs> Supranational bodies and organizations NATO, the alliance held an emergency meeting in Brussels condemning the Soviet coup. If indeed this coup did fail, it will be a great victory for the courageous Soviet people who have tasted freedom and who are not prepared to have it taken away from them." The United States Secretary of State James A. Baker III said, 
it will also, to some extent, be a victory, too, for the international community and for all those governments who reacted strongly to these events. NATO Secretary General Manfred Werner also said, We should see how the situation in the Soviet Union develops. Our own plans will take into account what happens there. Palestine Liberation Organization The Palestinian Liberation Organization was dissatisfied with the coup. Yasser Abed Rabdo, who was a member of the PLO Executive Committee, said he hoped the putsch will permit resolution in the best interests of the Palestinians of the problem of Soviet Jews in Israel. Topic. Further fate of GKCHP members Gennady Yanayev, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994, headed the Department of History and International Relations for the Russian International Academy of Tourism, died in 2010. Valentin Pavlov, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994 financial expert for several banks and other financial institutions, chairman of Free Economic Society, died in 2003 Vladimir Kriuchkov, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994, died in 2007 Dmitry Yazov, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994 advisor to Ministry of Defense and the Academy of General Staff Boris Pugo, committed suicide on the 22nd of August 1991. Oleg Baklanov, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994, Chairman of Board of Directors for Rosunchchemash. Vasily Starodutsev, freed from arrest in 1992 due to health complications, Deputy to the Federation Council of Russia 1993-95, Governor of Tula Oblast 1997-05, Member of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation since 2007, died in 2011. Alexander Tizyakov, Amnesty of the Russian State Duma of 1994, Member of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, Founder of series of enterprises such as Antel, machine manufacturing, Sevenaya Kazna, insurance company, Vidicon, production of electric arc furnace, Fidelity, production of fast moving consumer goods, died in 2019. See also Civil resistance, Dissolution of the Soviet Union History of the Soviet Union 1993 Russian Constitutional Crisis State Collapse Topic. Notes and references Topic. Bibliography Topic. External links Russia at the Barricades, Eyewitness Accounts of the Moscow Coup August 1991, ed. Victoria Bonnell, Anne Copper, and Gregory Fryden. Introduction by Victoria E. Bonnell and Gregory Fryden M. E. Sharp, 1994. Includes the chronology of the coup, photos, and accounts from a broad cross-section of participants and eyewitnesses, including the editors. Voices from an attempted Soviet coup. First-person accounts and documents from both sides of the barricades. Compiled and edited by Anya Chernyakovskaya, Dr. John Jirik and Nikolai Lam. IRC logs, transcript of internet chat from the time of the coup. TAS transmissions at the time of the coup, captured from short-wave radio transmissions, contains decoding errors. Andrew Coyne, getting to the roots of a deserved failure. The St. Petersburg Times No. 696 63, 17 August 2001 The issue of the St. Petersburg Times devoted to the 10th anniversary of the coup attempt. The collapse of Stalinism chronology of the coup the USSR in 1991, the implosion of a superpower by Dr. Robert F. Miller 1991 Diplomatic Blue Book, Section 4. The Soviet Union by the Japanese Foreign Ministry Moscow Coup, August 1991, Anonymous, Memories of an Anonymous Russian in Wiki Memory Archive Personal account and photographs of historian Douglas Smith, eyewitness to the coup 
Vadim Anatov, a programmer for RELCOM the first public ISP in the USSR on YouTube talking about the role of the Internet in resistance to the coup. Adventures of the Nuclear Briefcase a Russian Document Analysis, Strategic Insights, Volume 3, Issue 9, September 2004, by Mikhail Sipkin. Map of Europe showing areas affected by Soviet coup attempt. Gorbachev, Mikhail, 1991. The August Coup, The Truth and the Lessons. New York, Harper Perennial. Includes transcript of videotaped statement made 1920 August 1991 as his Forest Datcher.